Traditions are all around us. Some are new, some are inherited. Most are human, but not all of them are good. If human rules and traditions aren't what get us close to God, why keep them? We'll explore that and more right here on Sabbath School U. Guys, I'm excited for this study. Uh, let's just go around, let's introduce ourselves, Mars. If I, if I have to say no one thing about you, what would it be? Well, my name is Marcellus Ashley. Awesome, I know everything I need to know now. <laughs> let's go. Elroy? I am a New Yorker. New Yorker? Yeah. And we, here next to you is Angela? I'm Angela, <laughs> and that's pretty important to know. Mm -hmm. Other than that, I'm a Midwesterner, but with roots all over the world, so. Oh, I want to do this. I'm from Utah. Cool. All right, good. Ooh. You already said your one thing. You're done. I know, right? <laughs> no, no, no. This is good. Now, let's get into it. Let's get into our, our verse today is Matthew 15, 8, and 9. Uh, that's our memory verse for the day. Elroy, I'd like to ask you to read that, and then we'll have prayer, if you could have prayer for us. Sure. Um, Matthew 15, verse 8 and 9. Verse 8 reads, these people draw near to me with their mouth and honor me with their lips, but their heart is far from me, and in vain they worship me, teaching as doctrines the commandments of men. Uh, Father God, as we just read this verse, help us to be careful um, for what comes out of um, our mouth, God. Bless us, Lord, as we go into this lesson is our prayer in your name. Amen. Amen. All right, so if we look at this verse, what's the key issue here? What, what, what is Jesus' problem with uh, the Pharisees in this verse, or verses? Lip service. Lip service. I mean, you know, the Pharisees are here and they're talking um, about, about laws and legalities, but at the end of the day, they, um, God is saying, you honor me with your lips, but your hearts are far from me. So your hearts are far from yeah. me. Yeah. Cool, cool. So, you know, we're talking today about religious traditions, but really we should preface right away, these are not all religious traditions. You know, we can have very good religious traditions, praying, Praying in the morning is a great tradition. Reading your Bible is a great tradition. This is about traditions that are not as much traditions, but commandments, mm -hmm. that you take a human saying, a human statement, and you turn it into a commandment, and you mm -hmm. place it at equal value with God's law. So whenever we say uh, human, or we say religious traditions, that's what we're referring to. Now, I just want to open it up. How, why do you think we tend to place so much importance on our human traditions, it, religious or otherwise. Why do you think that, we, that that's such a huge thing for us? Because we, we can point at the Pharisees and say, all oh, those guys, but we, we all do it in, in some aspect of our lives. Why do you think that is? I think it's because we have a terrible memory, <laughs> just, just in general. And you go into studies about memory, and you'll see that memory mm -hmm. is terribly unreliable. Yeah. And so I think that it comes from both it's a way for us to preserve stuff, yeah. things that we did, but it only preserves the things that we did and not the reasons why we mm. did them. Mm. So it's a good tool, but why, why do we put such an emphasis on it? Why do we have that become the thing? I think a lot of it's comfort because mm. along with that thought of we have really bad memories, if something is a tradition and we repeat it enough times, it's comfortable, mm. we don't feel um, like something's new and there's change. I think a lot of people, they say uh, we're creatures of habits. Mm -hmm. And I think that's a big part of it, that it's comfort. And we like other people to be in the same, in the same situation or the same understanding. And I think that's also comfortable, that mm -hmm. I know what you're gonna do because it's the tradition. I don't have that insecurity of what's mm -hmm. he gonna do next? What's he thinking? What's he talking about? What's he gonna say? Mm -hmm. It's yeah. that I know what to expect from right. everybody. Right. Mm -hmm. So when, when we think, when we apply that to religious traditions, what are some religious traditions that come to mind right now? I mean, it's just all religions, including Christianity, are seeped in tradition for, for good or bad. Do, do any come to mind for you guys that, that you know, are particularly prominent? Christmas. Christmas. There you go. Hmm. Yeah, that's an example of taking something where it's completely man-made and we turn it into something maybe different than... And a blend of multiple traditions right. from multiple backgrounds and multiple it's a big mixed bag. Yeah, yeah, just that none of us remember right now. Right. <laughs> like none. It's not like any of us um, are considering the festivals and the services right. that went into this, or even Christ Mass itself. Right, right, right. Mm -hmm. We have our own thing that we remember from the tradition passed down to us. But Mars, I'm glad you brought that up because there are a lot. Of, this is a perfect example of. A lot of people will view Christmas and the different traditions associated with it and think that a lot of that is scriptural, mm -hmm. that we have a tree <laughs> or we do whatever. Right. The day is the day that Christ was born. But it's not tied anywhere in scripture. How do, then do we make that distinction? What is a commandment of God? What is a commandment of man? Well, mm. even with Christmas, you often, I remember in, in high school, they used to do this with us, ask us to recount mm. the story of Christ's birth. 
it's amazing how much of it isn't in the Bible at all. Mm -hmm. We yep. just have seen the stories in the children's books and we've heard it over and over. Mm. It's not in there. Right. Mm -hmm. right. You know, there's so many just different <clears throat> aspects that we go, no, that's, that's how it happened mm -hmm. until you realize oh, well, that's just what I'd always heard, but that wasn't in the Bible anywhere. Right, mm. and Christmas would be one example, but we have this all over throughout the entire thread, the whole fabric of Christianity and the Christian experience is part tradition, part commandment of God. How do we determine? How do we weed mm. through and determine what's, what's legit and what's not? I think it's always by finding true north. You yeah. always have to go back to scripture and go straight back to the commandments of God. This what is exactly source. is God saying? This is our source, not what man made, mm -hmm. but what God made. You know, mm -hmm. man's laws were meant to supplement, in a sense, the laws of God. But um, what is God saying? You know, um, what is man made and what's God made? I think you're hitting it because that's the only way to really determine. If we believe that scripture is the word of God, that's the only way to kind of sort it out. And I think, you know, it's something that we do need to take an initiative on because there are a lot of people saying things that aren't, that, that can mislead you. For instance, I was watching the news the other, flipping through the channels the other day, and I won't say who it was, but I came across a very famous commentator who was, to make his point, he said, well, I'm gonna, I'm gonna quote scripture and I'm gonna quote the Bible. It's like the Bible says, God helps those who help themselves. And we went, wait a minute, that is not in the Bible anywhere. That is nowhere in there. But People are watching this going, oh, wow, that's, that's scripture. Wow, God said that? <laughs> right, but it's right. not true. And so you're, you're presenting something that who knows who made that up. It's a you know, trite cliche in, in Christianity mm -hmm. and, and presenting it as, as the word of God. So I think it's, it is, Elroy, like you said, extremely important that we, we dive in and we say, okay, wait, what's legit and what's not? So I, I want to, with that in mind, let's, let's get into scripture. <laughs> yeah, let's do that. <laughs> so uh, I'm going to look through here. Let's, let's go to Ephesians 6, 17, and 18, Mars, if you could... If you could turn there for us, and we're gonna need fast fingers today because we're we're jumping all over the Bible. So keep your fingers loose. Mm -hmm. But I want you to read th those two verses, Ephesians six seventeen and eighteen. And take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God, with all prayer and petition. Prayer, pray at all times in the spirit, and with, and and with this in view, be on alert with all perseverance and petition for all the saints. So we have there this notion of. Uh, scripture, the Word of God is something that's very powerful, but it's tied to the Spirit. It's tied to the Spirit, and it's also tied uh, to prayer. So with that in mind, Angela, if you could read from uh, John 16, 13 for us, which, which we see this theme is developed uh, there as well. Okay, in John 16, 13. Um, but when He, the Spirit of truth, comes, He will guide you into all truth. He will not speak on His own. He will speak only what He hears, and He will tell you what is yet to come. I, I, isn't that amazing? <laughs> like, like we don't we don't just have God gives us the word. We we talked about that. That's important. That's important to knowing, um, knowing God's commandments and God's will in our life. But that's not it. It's not, you know, five people read one thing, they're going to get five different conclusions. God mm. also promises to send the Spirit to guide us mm. into this truth. So we have this two prong approach when we approach Scripture. If we have an open heart and open mind, we have the word. But the word itself almost comes to life in a sense in that it speaks to us mm -hmm. through the author of the word, through the spirit. Right, right, right. right. Yeah, and so it, it, when, when we have that in mind, we have this, this incredible sense of what it really means to approach God and it, it's the complete opposite. Human traditions, we construct them ourselves. They're our own fabrication. But Elroy, what, what does it mean to you when, when I think, okay, I'm going to the word, is that enough or do we, do we need to do something else in addition to that, right? It's not, it's not just I'm going to read it and see what it says. Right. I mean, you have to apply it. Right. You know, um, I remember in grad school when I was doing my research, uh, my teacher would often say, you know, don't just, don't just take it at my word. You know, go straight to the source, the, the yeah. exact source that I'm quoting this from. And so, you know, I realized that a lot of times pre prior to uh, my teacher saying that as a student, I would just say, oh, if my teacher said that, then that, that has to be the truth. Yeah, mm -hmm. right. You know, but the mere fact that my teacher was saying, no, go to the source. Um, and after you go to the source, then, you know, find a way to actually apply it to your research. It's the same thing with the word. Awesome. So that's how I feel um, the word speaks. You go to the word for truth. You go to the word and you go to God. And you to go to pray, God as well. Say, right. show, reveal yourself to me in your word. So Absolutely. you have, you go to both things. Um, I, I think what's important to note here, though, is that the Pharisees, going back to Matthew 18, Mm -hmm. or Matthew 15, they understood that this tradition 
they weren't confusing it with the Word of God. For instance, mm -hmm. they presented it as the tradition of the elders. Mm -hmm. So it, it's not just an issue of confusion, it's that they legitimately believed that the tradition of the elders was every bit as important as what was in, in the Word. So I, they, this tradition was not there to get in the way or to supplant, it was there to supplement. They created these traditions in order to help us better remember, better, remember, mm -hmm. better follow God's law, but it seems that somewhere we lost the way. Somewhere something goes wrong. Do you think that's inherent to them, or is, there, is, it, is it a fundamentally flawed approach? It's us. It's, it's, yeah. it's a part of the human condition. Right. Mm -hmm. It's a part of sin and what it does to our memory, our right. ability to, to focus right. on what's important. Right. Mm -hmm. And so do you think then that, does that mean you throw them out? Does that mean that re can religious traditions help us get closer? The, the original intent was good. Let's create something to help people better understand the law, better follow the, the law. Is it something that we can still use? Are, are religious traditions something that can help me, help you, help all of us get closer to God? I believe so, as long as they don't take precedent yeah. over God's law. And I think that was the issue. That was the issue that um, Christ had with the Pharisees. You know, mm -hmm. they started to juxtapose the law next to God's. So their man-made laws were almost turning into divine laws. It was almost mm -hmm. blasphemous by nature. Right. right. And, but I think the biggest thing is what is that pointing you to? Yes. A religious tradition can be very useful as long as you're always remembering where that points you to. Mm. So maybe, you know, behaving in a certain way isn't necessarily in the Ten Commandments, mm -hmm. but if you can remember what that is pointing you to. Mm. So I don't behave in this way because I don't want to become envious. Right, mm. right. Or because I don't want to get to that point where I hate my neighbor. Right. Mm. The tradition itself is good, but if you're only looking at the tradition, that's where the danger is. Mm -hmm. If you're not remembering what the goal of right. it is, what the end point is. Yeah, and mm -hmm. I, I think you hit it right on the head, and I think there's another layer I want to add to that as well, in that God's law, as far as the law, capital, capital L, mm -hmm. is universal. We believe that it is universal, applies to everyone. The thing mm -hmm. about traditions is, People are so different. God, has, God made us yeah. all so different mm -hmm. that I may have a tradition that works for me and my culture, my age group, my whatever, but it wouldn't work for you at all. What, how then does that have to influence how we perceive traditions? and, and how Because what might work for you wouldn't work for me at all. And I, I think a lot of it, if you look at human behavior or human tendencies, what tempts me isn't going to tempt you necessarily. Mm. Mm. So maybe I really need to stay away from one specific thing because mm. that's where I'm going to fall. Mm. But for you, it's not a temptation at all. You don't look at it twice. There's mm -hmm. no second thought. Mm -hmm. And so I can't necessarily judge your keeping my tradition right. mm. because to you it's not that important. It, is, it isn't where God's drawing your life to. Mm. But for me, it's extremely important. Mm. Yeah. And the same, you might have something that's very tempting to you that you need to avoid that I don't, I can walk right next to and it doesn't phase me, mm. but that doesn't mean that I need to judge you for avoiding it or you need to judge me for, for not making that a right. priority. Mm. You know what, you, what you're talking about makes me think of something like alcoholism or drug addiction. Mm -hmm. You know, someone who is an alcoholic they have to have a routine, of, of assuming that they, they've, they're trying to get past it. They have to have a routine right. in order to make sure that they don't fall back in. Someone who's in AA, for instance, they have the 12 steps. A lot of that is to create structure in your life so that you don't slip back into old habits. So someone who's an alcoholic has to do all kinds of things throughout their whole day, whereas I would, wouldn't need to do any of it, you know, because right. it's, not, it's not an issue for me, but for them it is. And so I really like what you're bringing up about really traditions, you can't make them the thing because they're all unique to us and we all need different things to point us to the universal, to God, to law with capital L and, and, and who God is. Mm. I, I think another thing that's interesting in, in, in this whole issue of religious tradition is, Elroy, what you pointed out originally that it was lip service, mm -hmm. that they, they, they were talking a good game but their hearts were far from them. And, and I want to point out something that, you know, if we go I have to steal this from Oleg, I'm a disciple of Cross Connection, so you, we, have to, we have to understand the original context. And if we go back to the first century uh, Jewish culture that the Pharisees were in, it was a culture, it was a time that was obsessed with this notion of ritual purity, of ritual mm -hmm. cleanliness. And it's a, it's a culture that they had these things called um, 
a common way to make yourself clean, ritually clean, was a mikvah. And a mikvah is like a big bath that you would walk down in mm -hmm. and then get out of, you know, and then when you got out, you were clean. And so they, they didn't have two sets of stairs. And again, I gotta give credit to Oleg for this. <laughs> they would go down the dirty set. Uh -huh. You know, you could only go down the dirty set because you're dirty. So you walk down the dirty set, you go in, you're clean, and then you come up the clean set of stairs. A different, mm. You come up a different way. Mm. So, and they would do this for everything. I'll just list a few examples for you. <clears throat> so they would have to do it, for instance, after emission of certain fluids. Women would have to do it every month after men menstruation. If you came in contact with someone who, during menstruation, you had to go in the mikvah. Uh, certain skin conditions, uh, like psoriasis and different things, you had to go in the mikvah. Um, coming into contact with a corpse or a grave or tomb or something like that, contact with unclean foods. Mm. And this is more with the issue that we're, we're coming to with the disciples. Sure. They, they were eating with unwashed hands. That made you the worst thing that you could be in that culture and that was ritually unclean. Mm -hmm. And this is kind of now, now we're, now we're kind of starting to get to the gospel <laughs> in that, mm -hmm. in that the, we all seem to think that there is something wrong with us. Mm -hmm. We all seem to, this was their culture's way of dealing with it. But it seems to be, I mean, would you agree that there's, that as humanity, we seem to have a universal sense that there's something inherently flawed in the human condition, or is that just unique to, to Judaism, Christianity, or whatever? I think there is something inherently flawed. The moment, um, the moment Eve touched the fruit, mm -hmm. there was something inherently flawed. We decided to make our own decisions. We decided to um, try to position ourselves with um, God and his level of understanding. Mm -hmm. So in a sense, we kind of became elitists, just saying, my way is better than your way. Mm -hmm. My culture is better than your culture. And we take our culture and the culture that we were brought up and we apply it to everyone else's. And mm -hmm. we, we create this moral compass by saying, well, I'm right, you know, and they're wrong. Mm. You know, and so we, I think we need to be very careful of how we apply that to other cultures. I'm having, you're like blowing my mind right now. <laughs> because, <I'm serious. laughs> really, no, really. Because really, we, we all have this desire. We all know that, that maybe we're unclean. Mm. And maybe that's the thing that gives us this impulse, this kind of ridiculous impulse, mm. to make me want to feel like I'm better than you, mm. Lawrence. And I've got to feel like I'm better than you. Mm -hmm. And so we invent these things. But really, it's this sense that I'm not worthy. I am, there's something wrong with me, so I've got to build myself up. Right. I've got to create a set of codes, a set of something that if I adhere to it, I will go, you know what, no, I am good, and I'm better than you, and now I get a false sense of worthiness and, and, and a feeling that, that I am clean, that there's, there's something good in me. So clearly the gospel says something else. Let's go to, uh, Elroy, if you could read Matthew 15, 11, and then stay in the same chapter, read verse 19. Sure. Matthew 15, 11, and verse 11 says, not what goes into the mouth defiles a man, but what comes out of the mouth, this defiles a man. Verse 19. Verse 19 says, For out of the heart proceed evil thoughts, murderers, adulteries, fornications, thefts, false witness, blasphemies. Mm. Isn't that powerful, when you, especially when we have this concept of constantly cleaning your outside? Is that, the, that that culture was in. I had to go in and make, for skin conditions, for all kinds of little, I, I touched something that was unclean. I've got to continue to wash my outside, but Jesus says, no, you are rotten at your core mm. and you're not acknowledging it. There's, there's something, I mean, I guess it sounds, it sounds like bad news at first, <laughs> or am I wrong? I don't know, it's, it's like, but, but we're rotten at our core. So if, Mars, you can jump to Matthew 23, 25. This is again to the Pharisees in a different, uh, a, a different meeting, but this is when Jesus is like really letting them have it. He's giving them the, it's called the seven woes, and he's just like tearing into these guys. And this is one of the, one of the things that he gives them. So let's, let's hear this one. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you clean the outside of the cup of the, and the dish, but inside they are full of robbery and self-indulgence. Mm -hmm. Mars, there was an exclamation point in there, but I'll forgive you for not, for not screaming it. <laughs> <laughs> but th th he's saying it again. You're, you're cleaning the out It's such a good analogy. Mm -hmm. Jesus was a clever guy. He, you, you're washing the outside of the cup, but the inside is dirty and disgusting mm -hmm. and rotten. So really, how, again, I don't want to be one of these guys, because I think we could even fall into, I, I don't want to accuse anyone of this, but sometimes we can even fall into kind of anti-Semitism, where we mm. say it was those Pharisees that were wrong. Mm. It, was the, it was the nation of Israel that messed it up, but I'm good. You know, so, but, but to turn it back on ourselves, how, how do I, Elroy, fight that urge to try and clean myself, to, to make myself pure? Uh, well, I've never been in a 12-step program, <laughs> <laughs> but I've often heard that- We're gonna that talk the, to you about that. <laughs> I've often heard that the first step a lot of times is admitting that there is a problem. Yeah. So I think the first thing I need to do is saying, oh my goodness, I am the Pharisee. 
I'm the one going around talking to people saying, you have an issue. Uh, you're living a life this way. You're dressed this way. You're behaving this way. But before I do that, I have to say, oh my goodness, I'm at fault here because mm. I'm every single one of the things I'm pointing my finger at mm. and acknowledging that and asking for God to work through me so um, I no longer judge but allow his life to live out in, in my actions and my words because it's what comes out of the mouth that defiles a man. Yes, yeah. Well, I disagree. I don't think it's on us. Um, mm. I think that... <laughs> I think that the, st the, the name of this right here, yeah. Christ and religious tradition, Christ is the thing that, that it's all supposed, supposed right. to be coming back to. Right. He's the way yes. that we um, cleanse ourselves. He's, he's the way that, yes. we, that we even discover the urge that we're dirty. Right. He's the truth that we use to correct our traditions and right. judge our traditions and see, yes. okay, are these lining up with yeah. the truth? Right. And he's the life that we live. Mm. from day to day in the way that we respond with each other. No, no, that's, that's powerful, really, because Jesus wouldn't come and, and say, here's, what, here's what's wrong with you, but not give the solution. He wouldn't say, here's what you're doing wrong, but not give the solution. And he, like, like he says, he, you refuse, you search the scriptures because in them you think that you have eternal life, mm -hmm. but it is, you refuse to come to me. These are they which speak to me. You refuse to come to me to have life. And that, that's exactly right, Mars. We've got to, we've got to go to Jesus because otherwise it's all, it's all a lie, it's all, it's all empty, it doesn't, it doesn't actually work. And I want to tie it back now to our, to our memory verse, which is Matthew 15, 8, and 9, but really Jesus is quoting Isaiah there. So I want us to jump back to the actual quote in Isaiah. And Angela, I wonder if you could read that. Isaiah 29, 13, and the beginning reads similarly, but the end is a little different, and I want to discuss how it's different in the end. Okay, Isaiah 29, 13, and it says... The Lord says, these people come near to me with their mouth and honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. The worship is of me is made up only of rules taught by men. Mm. Mm. You know, what, what version of the Bible are you reading on that one? I have um, NIV. NIV. Mm. Yeah, and to me, that, that's a slightly different twist on this in that, or not, it's not different, but it adds to, to what we're talking about in that people are actually using what people are saying Mm. And thinking that that's coming to God, and and Jesus is saying, whoa, 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 wait, wait a minute here. You know, is it is that something we still do, or are we going to Jesus because we're told to? You know, is that something mm. that we still experience in Christianity, or are we going because He calls us? Mm. I think there's a struggle there. There's yeah. a tension between knowing which laws are the laws of the Lord mm. and which laws are the laws of the land. Yeah. And you know, so I'm constantly trying to decide. Oh my goodness, how. What exactly is my relationship with God being predicated upon? Yep. Is it based on what something um, my mother and father may have told me, or is it something that I've actually truly read in Scripture that's actual truth? And I think this is literally um, what was going on in Isaiah here. It says, and their fear toward me is taught by the commandment of men mm -hmm. here in the New King James Version. So it's a I commandment like of men here, yeah. not the commandment of God. So yes. there's a little, bit of an, of an, a little bit of an issue there. I mean, i got to say, this, this really speaks powerfully to me because I grew up in the church, mm -hmm. and... I gotta say, for mo for most of my life, I was told by human beings to go to Jesus, mm -hmm. and but even when when you're when you're told to, you're not really going to him, you know. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't until much later in my life, so if, you know, just a few years ago, that you feel the call of Jesus, you know, bringing you to him, and that is really when you encounter him. And mm -hmm. and I, I think that's that's true for a lot of people in our lives, and you know, as they advance in years and get older, I start, you know, you start to think of, well, if I have kids, how do I? How do you show them Jesus and not, right, right. you know what I mean? How do we as Christians walk that line of, of having, just presenting Jesus versus trying to shove them to Jesus? I think an interesting, another interesting aspect that I've kind of had running around in my mind while mm -hmm. you've talked, because you, we talked about cleaning yourself in different ways and when you first hear that, you think that has nothing to do with me. I don't. Mm. I don't act like that or, mm. you know, that's not a part of my daily life. But when you think about it, I know a lot of non-religious people, mm. very close friends, family members, either agnostic, atheists, and it's interesting because their concept or their view of the world, they do see inherent bad in the world. Mm. They're not going to say human beings are wonderful right. because they see all the bad things that are happening. Mm. But what they do see is that you can correct that yourself. That if I do enough good things, if I volunteer enough, if I, if I serve those around me enough, mm. 
then I'm improving myself. And I think we fall into that too, that we think I'll improve myself, be more active in church, yeah. read my Bible more, mm. pray more, but we're not, we're not looking at the purpose of those, right. but instead, okay, to improve myself as a Christian, I have to do these things. Mm -hmm. But it's still, like you said, it's not, it's not Christ doing it. We still think we're doing it for ourselves. Right. Mm -hmm. That I will get more involved in church. I will go and feed the, the hungry. I will go and visit the poor. But it's not that relationship right. that's right. bringing us to it. And, and I think that's kind of what brings us to close, now that we're nearing our close, that's what kind of what we have to come to. As Christians, we are part of a religion that is, you know, like it or not, extremely fragmented into many denominations mm -hmm. and all based on humans in that, you know, Lutherans are based on a person and other people are based on a person. You know, Adventism is based on, on a few people, but Ellen White, a person. You know, you have all these things that, that people have sprouted all of these different traditions and denominations in Christianity, how then can we find unity? And I think the answer uh, is in John 13, 32. Um, if you want to turn to it, it, it I'll, I'll, I'll just say it. It says, Jesus said, and I, when I am lifted up, will mm. draw all people, mm. all people to myself. Amen. And really, sometimes we turn it into a trite expression, but it's, it's there at the mm. cross. That we, that we find unity, that, that we see God for who he really is, and we see maybe tradition for what it really is mm -hmm. and put it in its right context. But it is there at the cross, even with all our different traditions, with all our different um, perspectives, if we're at the cross, Jesus drew all of us. Rather than command, human commandments mm -hmm. pushing mm -hmm. us there, mm -hmm. Jesus is the one who, who draws us, and we're all one people there mm -hmm. at the cross. So I, I think... You know, all this stuff of, hum of tradition and all these different things, it's, it's all well and good as, as long as we have the cross, I think Amen. we're good. Anyways, Amen. guys, we got to wrap it up. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> thank you very much for joining us. Appreciate every single one of you. Thank you for joining us and watching at home. And remember, whenever you think of the law, think of Romans 13, 8. Love is the fulfillment of the law. If you would like to contact us, please visit our website at www.sabbathschoolu.org. That's www.sabbathschool, the letter U, dot org. Remember, the goal of Bible study is information and transformation. It's for the heart and for the head. For Sabbath School U, I'm Sergio. Peace.